so what is this piece doing? Well, this piece is with the cap, but uh, this is the arm. Uh -huh. We were having issues with, like, flexion. Ah. Um, so just, just need, like, an I-beam type structure. Cute. Hi, I'm Michael Littman, a professor in the computer science department. And I'm also one of the co-organizers with Chad Jenkins and Bertram Malley of the Humanity-Centered Robotics Initiative, or HCRI, which is an effort that we're doing uh, to try to bring people across the campus together to focus on how to create robots that help people and work with people. And we decided that a really important aspect of that was the design of the robots themselves. We have strengths across campus in lots of different areas that are really important in understanding how robots act and how to program robots, but not really so much on building the robots. We thought it would be really helpful if we teamed up with folks in engineering and the visual arts and some folks at, at the Rhode Island School of Design to start to get an idea of what it would be like to build some robots on our own. We thought a good idea would be to bring a bunch of students together and run a class where the students would actually focus on questions of how to design humanity-centered robots. So we started off with designs of robots that are currently for sale through companies like Suitable Technologies. They have a robot called the Beam and there's a robot called the Vigo. You can drive the robot around remotely and interact with people. It's a very powerful thing to be able to do, but current telepresence robots are fairly limited in what they're able to do. We thought it would be a fun idea to think about how we could augment the design of these robots to help people and the way that we decided to focus was on questions of how could we help people in, for example, a nursing home environment. We went to the St. Elizabeth's community and spoke with people there about what sort of functionality they'd really need for people to be able to interact with each other through these telepresence robots. The students came up with a lot of really good ideas and the class has been about trying to implement them. The Brown Design Workshop has been a really important resource to us in being able to bring this idea to fruition. So instead of just having the idea, oh, we can think about robots and what they should be like, we can actually get in here and start building things. And the resources are just wonderful. I've been working closely with Ian Goncher as the co-instructor of the class, and he's a very talented designer in his own right, but has a tremendous amount of experience drawing those kinds of ideas out of people and bring them into the real world. Make people do things that they didn't even know that they were able to do. Brown Design Workshop is a space where students can design and make things. But it's more than a space. It's a community. It's a culture of design. It's a place where students can immerse themselves in project-based learning. Classes like Designing Humanity-Centered Robots give students the opportunity to iteratively prototype. Okay. And we're going to drill the motor in and then Should attach like this? this. Yeah, we okay. also, um, we also put these on so it didn't wiggle side to side. Nice. Good solution. In classes like these, students are encouraged to document their work, reflect on it, critically engage it as they share it with their peers, making their learning meaningful to themselves and others. It's about process and product. Designing Humanity Center Robots is also an experiment in cross-disciplinary collaboration. The class this semester is made up of a remarkably diverse group of engineers, designers, computer scientists, artists, amongst others. This diversity is crucial as it provides both the technical and theoretical resources necessary to design and build something as complex as a robot. Students were challenged to explore big questions relating to telepresence, embodiment, tele-intimacy, and the needs of the user. But they also needed to navigate the technical resources they would need to actualize their ideas. Everyone brought a different set of skills to the class. We explored the hardware and the software, and the tools necessary to bring our concepts to fruition. We explored Arduinos, 3D printing, laser cutting, CAD, human-centered design strategies, amongst many other tools that informed our creative process. When we started the Humanity Centered Robotics Initiative, uh, roughly two years ago, uh, one of the things that we realized is that there was kind of three spheres that needed to intersect for us to really make progress on this problem. One was social, which is interacting with people. One is the physical world, so actually having something that moves in space. And one is decisions, intelligence, computation. And all the groups had to worry about all three of those things. And so even though we brought together a lot of professors at, at Brown and, and RISD to talk about humanity-centered robotics, nobody was really working in the intersection of those three. It was some people working on the computation, some on the physical stuff, some on the social stuff, and you guys have had to face the problem of, of making them all work together. So, that's great. My name is Denai Mataksa Kakabuli, and I'm a senior at Brown majoring in computer science and science and society. My focus in computer science right now is in human-computer interaction, so I'm really interested in the
the ways that technology impacts society and also the ways that society impacts technology. Taking a class like this is really valuable to me because I get to work with people from a really wide variety of disciplines. RISD students, people in design, people in furniture, um, engineers. What we're trying to do is bridge the gap between humans and technology in a way that's intuitive and natural. The project I'm working on right now is called the Beastie Bot. And the idea behind the Beastie Bot is that we wanted to create uh, a robot that would navigate a space in a more natural way than anything we have right now. So rather than sitting with uh, arrow keys um, and not being able to move around at all, uh, we have a handheld controller that looks like this, which controls both the movement with here and the scroll wheel controls the arm, as well as a matching hat that mimics your movement with a gyroscope. So you can, like that, you can tilt your head uh, to turn left or right. We did the tilt because if you're looking at a screen, you don't want to turn your head away because then if you turn back, your camera will turn with you. And you can also move up and down. So you can look at your arm, you can look at the ceiling, uh, which is another thing you can't do. So from the very beginning, um, I wanted to be also used as a standalone unit. And so uh, if you can see through the acrylic here, there's an Arduino with a Wi-Fi shield. And there's the same setup over here on my head. Uh, there's an accelerometer on here that can detect the, my head's movement. And so it sends all the signals to the, the Arduino over there to control the two stepper motors, which has uh, a camera and a screen on it. If it's used as a standalone unit, then there will be another screen here, preferably maybe a phone that would slide right here. Say I'm in a video call with my parents in China, they would have the same setup there, and I would be controlling the phone on their side, they would be controlling the phone on my side. So it's, a, it's, a, it's an extra level of control over what you can see during a video call. So I'm Ryan Mather and I'm a senior at RISD. And I'm Barbara and I'm a senior studying industrial design at RISD. So we're envisioning this telepresence robot slash walker in a near future scenario where it can provide another strata of level of care for older adults that need some assistance to stay independent. So we thought about maybe somebody having something like this in their home. The telepresence aspect of it would allow them to communicate with their loved ones and with their doctors potentially. The walker aspect of it will help them get around. Also, um, we've got, so it has the ability to flip up so that it can be stored more vertically so that it doesn't have such a wide footprint. Like a traditional walker has a really large footprint. So it's a more, it can be used better in social situations where many people have them. Um, and so we're going to show you that. Yeah. Oh. So it can actually be remotely piloted over our user app. We have a web interface for it, and so anyone who just so you know, this is the first there. time we have ever seen it work. <laughs> <laughs> About 75% of the residents of St. Elizabeth's use a walker at least some of the time. So it's something that people have with them. It's an object that they're used to having in lots of different parts of their life. And we thought that it would feel a lot more like they had ownership over that object if we used a form that they're already used to interacting with and have with them all of the time. My name is Emma Funk and I'm a junior at Brown University, currently in the computer science department and the history department. Brown has really pushed me to think about things divergently and to consider a lot of different perspectives and to realize that thought process ideation is a really crucial part to the design process because it gets you to think conceptually in a really broad, iterative manner and then go into the actual craftsmanship of making things. Our project was trying to figure out how can we take this idea of presence as this very complicated human experience and break it down into sensory experiences that are almost like single gestures that we could sort of recreate with some simple robotics. So the two things I've been working on are a wristband that heats up when a temperature sensor senses the temperature around you and determines that it's cold enough that you need to be warmed up. So like a friend or a loved one, it reacts to warm you up in a human tactile way. The other one is thinking about vibration and thinking about the way that footsteps can communicate and the way the different parts of your body touch other people in a gestural, affectionate way. 
Initially, when we started our user research, we asked a lot of questions of people who are in long distance relationships, not necessarily romantic ones. We asked about relationships that persist when we go to college with our family, with our friends, and also with romantic partners, and how, um, how beyond Skype and beyond a voice and a face on a screen, we can still feel present with someone even though they're not there, and kind of exploring whether that presence is real and how it's different from true human presence. So um, we kind of took that idea and we all branched off and we tried to isolate individual expressions of human intimacy in small artifacts. Um, a lot of us in this group didn't really have a lot of technical experience before this, so it was both an exploration of the concept and also of kind of the difference between um, some gestures that are very natural and human and the kind of arduous work it takes to bring that to life through machinery and how difficult it can be to translate humanity into gears and electricity and, and sensors. So we've been really excited about the class and the possibilities that this opens up and we hope to, to really keep this momentum going and create a real community of people who can build very creative things.